How's everybody doing? Awesome. I uh, want to say welcome to Ashburn and, and thank you guys for again for being a part of our church. We love you guys so much and thank you for all your efforts out there in Brambleton trying to win people to Jesus. It's an honor to be partnering with you. Um, I want you to keep an open mind tonight as we go through the uh, message. Um, I'm, I'm saying that you're thinking, oh man, what's he going to say next? But um, just we'll talk about a few things that, that God says in his word that probably isn't real popular, but um, I just want you to keep an open mind about it and don't get ticked off at me or whatever. Um, <clears throat> I think probably one of the greatest problems that marriages go through is confusion. And you see, God is the one that invented marriage. You know, he invented it. So he came up with the template for it. He's the one that chose what it looked like. He's the one that chooses how it operates. And so he gives us this incredibly ordered, beautiful, clear, wonderful institution called marriage. And then we get it, and we pretty much make it about as clear as mud. Uh, we confuse things. And, um, you know, God designed marriage as uh, one man, one woman, in a sense, really becoming one person. And so really what he did was, and, and this is just the, his design, this is what God's word says, that he designed it as a heterosexual relationship that lasts a lifetime. Uh, and again, God is the inventor, and that's how God designed it. So what we tend to do is, is we, we kind of interject things, and, and we bring changes into the institution that God made. And as a result of it, things get kind of confusing. And it's just really just the way it is when it comes to either same-sex marriage or um, living together outside of marriage. Or, you know, breaking your vows in a marriage and uh, whether it's adultery or whatever it may be, you know, those aren't the greatest things in the world to talk about. And I'm sure it's kind of quiet in here right now. But um, the fact of the matter is really all those things make what God chose marriage to be. It just really kind of confuses things. It just makes it confusing, you know. Um, and without getting into a lot of specifics about that, um, for example, if, you know, if you're living together with somebody outside of marriage, you know, a lot of times, generally speaking, for one person, they're loving it. They're going, yeah, I love this scene. This is a great setup, you know, or whatever. And then a lot of times there's one person that's always kind of hoping and wondering if things would ever really, you know, there would be commitment or if somebody's going to make the decision to say, hey, let's get married and let's, you know, not just pretend like we're married, but let's really be married and let's really have the commitment. And I think until that happens, I think, it's just confusing, you know. Um, I think it's the same thing when it comes to um, divorce a lot of times. And, and, and let me just say a couple things about divorce. And r really what happens, I think, a lot of times is we, we change the definition and the roles and the terms of marriage. We minimize the value of marriage. And then sometimes we wonder why we're confused about marriage or we wonder why we're struggling so much in marriage. And I just think literally that you know, God comes up with this insane, incredible, awesome template because he's the God of the universe and he's a creator and he is the inventor of this amazing relationship. And, you know, when we change it, we just confuse things. Um, when it comes to divorce, you know, I can honestly say that if it affects one in two marriages, that probably just about every other family in here is affected by it. Really, every family is affected by it for sure in this church, um, without a doubt. Um, my belief is, and people may agree with me or not agree with me on this, uh, people may think I'm liberal or whatever, um, but I, I honestly believe that, you know, if, if you're divorced and maybe you're sitting here thinking, well, it was mainly my fault or, or whatever, I don't know, whatever, I, it always takes two to tango is what I say. Um, the, the bottom line is there's not a person in this room that doesn't make mistakes. There's not a person in this room that has a perfect record. You know, and if the only people that God used was perfect people, then guess what? Not, well, not much, nothing would be getting done with, by us because we're all imperfect. And so one of the things that I say is this. You can't do right yesterday. You can do right today. I can't do right. And, you know, I, I kind of call myself, um, I don't know if, if screw up is a bad word. I know there's kids in here, but sorry if I'm saying a bad word. But um, I kind of look at myself sometimes as the chief screw up when it comes to making mistakes or, you know, and the way I look at it is you guys give me the awesome opportunity, even as with that kind of past or whatever's in my past to be your pastor. It's an honor to be able to be your pastor. And so 
uh, the bottom line is we all make mistakes. And if you're sitting here tonight and you think, well, I didn't want a divorce and it kind of happened in my life and I didn't even want it to happen, but it did happen. Well, there's not a person in this room that doesn't have to at times make the best of a challenging or difficult situation. We all do. Everybody does. It's part of life. So what do you do? Well, you go with where you are right now. And you just say, God, I love you. And I'm going to serve you. And I'm going to do right. And, you know, so all, all I'm saying is, is we all, we all kind of get wrapped up sometimes in this confusion. And pretty much 100% of the time, anytime there's confusion, it's because it's something that we've added to what God made beautiful and perfect and clear uh, without any confusion whatsoever. So um, the only reason I bring it up is because, you know, confusion leads to hopelessness. I honestly believe that. And the only reason I would bring up issues that are tense, not because I want tension in the room. Hey, let's make it tense. I love tension. I'm loving conflict. I love it when people hate my guts. I don't love any of that, <laughs> to be honest with you. What I love is when people get set free. What I love is when people make the transition from hopelessness to hope. That's what I love. And, and I can guarantee you this. The Bible says that the truth will set you free. You know, and I just honestly believe that it will. And so that's why we talk about stuff like this. But um, so let's look at a couple of verses. Ephesians 4, 17 the Bible says, with the Lord's authority, let me say this, live no longer as the ungodly do, for they're hopelessly confused. When I read that verse, it hit me right immediately, right across the face. And I noticed that it didn't say that they're wonderfully confused. It says they're hopelessly confused. And the reason for those two words being together is that confusion leads to hopelessness. And confusion in a marriage, I believe, leads to a hopeless marriage. And hopelessness in a marriage. And that's why the Bible specifically says this about God. It says that, that God is not the author of confusion, right? I mean, he's got nothing to do with confusion. Anything that's confusing in your life whatsoever, God had nothing to do with it at all. God will never lead you into a confusing situation. He'll never lead you into a hopeless situation. He'll always lead you into a situation where there's hope and where there's answers, where there's clarity. You know, he always will. And, you know, 1 Corinthians 14, I believe, proves it because it says that he's not the author of confusion, but he's the author of peace. And so whatever he does and whatever he uh, designs leads to hope and clarity and peace. And so, you know, we can trust him there. And, and, and that's one of the things that I say, too, is even though in society there's all kinds of stuff going on about what we should do and how we should act and, you know, on and on and on. Let me just say this to everybody in this church. It's okay to trust God's template. It's okay. I mean, it's okay to trust him. It's okay to trust his word. And there's no reason why you can't. There's no reason why you shouldn't. Even if there's stress or pressure from outside or whatever to do whatever, say whatever, believe whatever. All I'm saying is it's okay to believe in God and trust in him. You know, and some people may think it's out of date or you know, or whatever, but the truth is, it's the best thing to do. So here's my definition of what confusion is. Confusion is when a person struggles between doing good, what they know is right, and what they know is wrong. And the reason I say that is because everybody knows the difference between right and wrong. We all do. I always just say we're just good at playing dumb, you know. We're good at pretending like we don't know the difference, but we know the difference. And the reason we know the difference is because, you know, God made us in his image, and he put his law on our hearts. So intuitively speaking, we know the difference between right and wrong. We know it. Confusion happens when we tend to turn our back on what's right, and we begin to talk ourselves into accepting what's wrong in our lives. And all of a sudden, we're going to start getting confused. You know, there's definitely going to be confusion in our lives. Now, confusion comes when there's two opinions that vie for your attention. Let me give you an example of that. Sometimes, it, not sometimes, a lot of times it happens in marriages. Sometimes a husband will come up to his wife and he'll just put his hands on his head and he'll go, I'm so confused. I'm confused about you. I'm confused about this marriage. I don't know what to do with this marriage anymore. Let me tell you what that's code for. 
Anytime somebody comes up to you, maybe not every time, all right? But pretty much every time when somebody comes up to you and says they're confused about something in their marriage, what's happening is this. What they're saying is this. You're telling me one thing, and somebody else that you don't know about is telling me something different. I don't know how many times I have looked at a couple and I have said this. Somebody else is talking to her. I don't know who it is. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's an inappropriate relationship. Maybe it's somebody at work. Maybe it's whatever. I don't know whoever it is, but somebody else is talking to her. I'm going to ask Garrett if you could turn me down just a smidgen. Thank you so much. Um, so we have to understand that, you know, this is going to only lead to confusion. That's really all it's going to lead to. And the next verse in Ephesians chapter 4 Basically, what it tells us is it tells us in in basically in chapter 17, it says that confusion leads to hopelessness. Verse number 18 and verse number 19 give us two ways that we become confused. The first way in verse number 18 is when we close our minds. Our minds are closed. I'm done. I'm, I, I've made up my mind. Uh, my mind is closed as far as I'm concerned. The more you close your mind off from the truth, the more it has the opportunity to fill with darkness. And the farther you get away from the life of God, you shut your minds, you harden your hearts, and you're creating almost an impossible situation for your marriage when you have a closed mind. I honestly believe that the more you close your mind to his truth, the farther you get away from God, the farther you get away from God, the more confusing life gets. And the reason for that is because your purpose and you know, everything about you revolves around your maker. It all revolves around God. The farther you get away from him, the more crazy and confusing life is going to get. One of the most dangerous obstacles anybody will face in their marriage is when they have a closed mind. Now, some people talk about it and joke about it and treat it as if it's no big deal. They'll just say, oh, he's so stubborn. He's just so stubborn. He's so stubborn, so stubborn. They may be treating it in a lighthearted way, but inside they're dying. Because it's tough to deal with somebody that's stubborn. It's tough. I mean, you, th you think to yourself, <laughs> I mean, ain't nothing in the world going to move this person after they made up their mind, right? And they think they know the right way and, and, and whatever. And so it's a difficult thing. Matthew 13 blows me away because it talks about the word of God being a seed and it talks about the soils being four different kinds of hearts. It says that the footpath is a closed mind, the rocky soil is a shallow mind, the thorny soil is a preoccupied mind, the fertile soil is an open mind. And what gives me the chills about Matthew 13 is it says this, as powerful as the word of God is, it will not penetrate a closed mind. That is scary. It is scary. Anytime somebody comes up to me after church and says, Man, that touched my heart. It was a blessing to my heart. First thing I think of, first thing I say every single time is this. You have a soft heart. You have an open mind. The word of God doesn't do that in a person when their mind is closed. Your mind could be closed and you could be holy and righteous and whatever. And you could sit here and think, boy, this message is good for him, him, him and her. <laughs> the whole time, right? Basically, what you just said was. My mind is closed. Or you could sit and just be ticked off the whole time. You know, or whatever. Um, Matthew says that it doesn't penetrate. I talk to people all the time, you know, that are married. They'll come into my office, and I'm sitting there. And how many of you guys have a conversation with yourself every time you have a conversation with someone else? I do it all the time. I'm going, and na 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 And then I'm saying to myself, they're not listening to a word I'm saying right now. And I can tell it all over their face. Their face is showing me like, if Jesus fell out of the ceiling onto this table, I'm not doing what you're telling me. I've already made up my mind. So just go ahead and keep on talking. I'm telling you, it happens all the time. Other people, you're sitting there talking, and they're going like this the whole time. And you're going, they're tracking. You know, their mind's open, their heart's open. So you can just a lot of times see it on their face. 
I talked to a couple one time in another state. It was not here, so I'm not throwing anybody under the bus. <laughs> but I talked to a couple one time. It was a very bad situation. I said, there is no possible way I know what to say. So I decided that I was just going to open up the Bible and start reading it. I opened up the Bible and I just started reading it. And I thought in my mind, I'm a young pastor. The word of God is powerful. This, these two people are going to fall down on their knees. Tears are going to start. They're going to come across the table and hug each other and kiss and embrace. It's going to happen. I'm reading the Bible. <laughs> this is the Bible. <laughs> this is the word of God. It's going it's to rock their world. It's going to melt down every barrier. After I was done, he came across the table. But he wasn't trying to hug her. He was trying to slug her. I'm going to tell you, you have a closed mind. You can read the Bible for 15 hours. It's not going to do anything to you. It's not going to get into your heart. It's not going to make any difference. It just isn't going to do it. I've seen it over and over. Close your mind to God's word. It will not penetrate your heart. Here's what I think we ought to ask ourselves. Maybe ask your wife or ask your husband. Is my stubbornness killing our marriage? It's an awkward question. <laughs> Slightly. But I don't think there's anything wrong with asking it. Am I stubborn? Ask the question. And, you know, always get that. It's, it's just good to talk about. The second thing that brings confusion is apathy. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 19. The Bible says they don't care anymore. They don't care. I don't care. I don't care about right and wrong. I don't care if these ways are immoral. My life is filled with impurity and greed. Whoop-de-doo. Who cares? The most dangerous place you can be in your marriage, I believe even worse than a closed mind, is when you become apathetic. And I'm not talking about the person that just says, well, I just don't care. I don't care. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about sometimes your feeling for your husband or wife literally is dead. It can be as dead as a doornail. That is scary. I have couples come to me and say, all she does is yell at me and scream at me. I always think, well, good. At least she's got some emotion for you and some feeling for you. I sort of think it's kind of a good thing. There's a little bit of passion there. That means it's not completely dead. There's not complete and total utter apathy. When a person says, I don't care if I get divorced, I don't care what anybody thinks, I don't care what the consequences are to my family, I don't care what God thinks, says, or does, I don't care about breaking my promise, did I say this, but I don't care. I don't care. Some people get to the place where they say, I'm too tired to care anymore. I can honestly say I have no love, no energy, no feeling towards this person at all. Nothing. <laughs> it's a scary thing. It's apathy. And it infects and ruins marriages. And it causes incredible confusion, which leads to hopelessness. We always say that when we're exhausted, we'd rather do what's easy than what's right. And if you're slipping into apathy, then what I would say is basically this. Don't let it slip any further. Don't let your marriage slip any further into apathy. Start doing things that show love. And this sounds a little bit awkward, but, you know, for, for your wife, it, it may not be love in the bedroom. It may be the fact that you actually did the dishes or helped out in some way, shape, or form. I'm not sure how that got in there because that's not in my notes. I didn't even write that one down. Maybe, maybe you just need to communicate feeling to your husband or to your wife. Maybe you need to put forth the energy. And sometimes people get to the place where they say, I just don't have the strength to do it anymore. I'm trying, and it's just not working. And I'm beat, dead dog tired. If confusion brings hopelessness to a marriage, then here's the question. How can I have clarity and peace? God, in the same chapter, gives us a pathway to peace. There's six quick things. Number one. You need to be truthful. If you want peace in your marriage and you want a lack of confusion in your marriage, if you want clarity in your marriage, then you need to be truthful. 
I think as a believer in Jesus, your job and my job at the end of the day is to sit on the end of the bed and say, yep, boom, I'm a little bit more like Jesus today. Night. Literally, that's the way it ought to be. Every single day of our lives, we ought to be a little bit more like Jesus. And the Bible says that Jesus is truth. So if Jesus is truth, then the more you tell the truth, every time you tell the truth, you're a little bit more like Jesus. Every time you tell the truth, you're a little bit more like Jesus. So I say this, always tell the truth to your husband or to your wife. You're probably sitting there like, duh, but I'm telling you, it's a big deal. And I'm talking even from the most smallest, minute things. You think, well, it's not a big deal, just a little a little lie. Always tell the truth. Anytime you lie to your husband or wife, here's what you do. You chip away and you erode at the only thing that you as a couple and as a marriage have to stand on. You literally erode the foundation that you as a husband and wife have to stand on. You're, you're knocking the floor out underneath you and you're going to, you know, fall. Proverbs 12, 22 says, the Lord detests lying lips. He delights in men who are truthful. Simple Christianity 101, we say it all the time at Park Valley. Christianity 101 is hate what God hates, love what God loves, right? Well, he hates lying lips. So we need to hate the same thing he hates and love the same thing he loves and delights in. Don't just tell the truth, but I think we also ought to live the truth when it comes to our husbands and and wives. And it's a simple thing. It's a little thing. We even teach our kids this. Be where you're supposed to be, doing what you're supposed to be doing, when you're supposed to be doing it. And I say this. Live your life in a way where you honestly and truthfully have nothing to hide. You don't care if they see anything or see you anywhere or see anything you're doing. You literally have nothing to hide and nothing to fear whatsoever. Everything's an open book. Everything's out in the open. Live a life of truth. Choose to live that way when it comes to your Facebook account or your social media. Ain't nothing to hide. Literally, nothing to hide. I'm going to tell you this. Reconnect with an old girlfriend and watch how confusing your marriage gets. It's going to be real confusing. Reconnect with an old boyfriend in an inappropriate way and watch the confusion just blossom. I'm telling you right now, it will. It absolutely will. Live a life of truth when it comes to your private computer habits. When everybody else goes to bed and you're the only one up. Or when you're alone. Live a life of truth with your conduct at work and when you travel on business and when you contact have contact with people of the opposite sex, you know, make sure that you live a life of truth. Have you ever wondered why when trust is breached, the one who breaches the trust always says, we just need to move on, move on, move on. And the person that got hurt when the trust was breached says, I want to know all the details. Literally every time, it's the same thing. I've talked to a gazillion people that have been through the same thing. One's over there going, well, we just need to move on. The other says, no, we just need to camp here for a while. Uh, We're pitching a tent. Let's see, uh, every time, (laughs) 100% of the time. And here's the reason why. The person is always wondering, are they telling me the truth? I don't know if I've got all the truth. And literally all they're saying out of fear is this. I don't know if I have anything to stand on. I don't know if I have any foundation. I don't know if there's any chance that we can even rebuild this yet because I don't even know if you're telling me the truth now. And literally, that's all it is. It's a foundational thing. Most skyscrapers, their foundations go 150 feet deep into the earth until it reaches bedrock. Trust is the bedrock of your marriage. And it needs to be deep. And it needs to be real. And it needs to be something that you live on a regular basis. 
Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 25 says, put away all falsehood, tell your neighbor the truth, because we belong to each other. Number two, remain calm. You want clarity in your marriage? Remain calm. Ephesians 4, 26 says, don't sin by letting anger gain control of you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, for anger gives a mighty foothold to the devil. It's a scary thing when you have a relationship with somebody who literally, for no reason whatsoever, goes off the deep end and freaks out and goes ballistic. That's scary. Because you're, you're never quite sure what it is that sets them off. And you're always wondering when the next time is going to be when they go ballistic. And so you're convinced in this relationship that you're the problem. And so what you do is, is you try to create this perfect environment so that they never get angry again. Of course, it doesn't work. It's impossible. You are not the problem. And in doing this impossible task, guess what happens? You lose hope. And when you lose hope, you begin to become apathetic and love begins to die and on and on it's the same thing and it's just weird when a husband one day says I love you and the next day is yelling at you and he is putting you down you know what that is it's confusing it's confusing I think a lot of times when it comes to anger we just need God at the center of our life the angry person is at the center of their life when I'm angry, I'm at the center of my life, not God. I am. And what happens is I want to control everything around me. And when things don't go right around me, everybody's going to know it. And it's everybody else's fault. I'm telling you right now, that's what happens. The other night, we got two snowflakes that came down onto the road. I think there were two in Prince William County, maybe two in Loudoun County. And they canceled the planning commission, which is our first public hearing. So I'm on the phone with the attorney, and I have smoke coming out of my ears. And you know what? It wasn't his problem, and it wasn't his fault. And I'm going, okay, so it puts us back another month. You know, and I'm like, I'm so this is ridiculous. We're on the expedited agenda. We would have gotten approved. We would have, you know, whatever. He's like, yeah, I know, pastor. <laughs> so literally, I'm praying not long after that. In the middle of my prayer, I, I always start with praying the Lord's Prayer. So I start praying the Lord's Prayer, and I go, you know, my Father in heaven Hallowed be thy name. I, you're, I ho you're holy. Thy kingdom come. Then I went, thy will be done. And it was literally almost as if God just went. Whoosh. And I look up with a bloody nose and I went, got it. <laughs> it's your will. For whatever reason, God didn't want it to happen. For whatever reason, it got stopped. And I'm the one on my knees as the pastor praying for God's will to be done, and I'm yelling at the attorney for something that was completely out of his control. That's what happens with anger. We are convinced we're in control, and when things go bad around us, we let everybody know it. God's got to be at the center. It's his will. His will be done. If God allows something to happen that doesn't you know, fit within our perfect world, then guess what? God's going to get us through. Three things to help you with anger. Number one, help me with anger. I'm a chief anger person. <sighs> Here's what I need. You see, a lot of times people will say this. They'll say, well, I'm a yeller. <laughs> Sorry I'm a yeller, but I'm a yeller. That's what you got when you married me. You got a yeller. My dad was a yeller. His dad was a yeller. His dad was a real big yeller. And so basically what happens is this. If that's the case, and we blame it on our parents or our grandparents or whatever it may be, or our situation, what we need to do is, is say, well, my dad was a yeller. Then the question you need to ask yourself is, how did you feel when your dad yelled at you? You probably felt about that big. 
Well, that's how you make your wife feel, or that's how you make your husband feel if you do the same thing. I think we just need to ask ourselves, how do we feel when somebody yells at us? Second thing is, there's almost a little bit of a selfish element to this, but it's in the Bible. So basically, I think we need to remember whatever you give out, you get back. It's called the law of sowing and reaping. So you can take a step back and say, you know what? I'm not going to yell and scream at this person because a little bit selfish. I don't want anybody yelling and screaming at me. I don't want to show this person that I'm ticked off and that I'm angry all the time because I don't want people to be ticked off and angry all the time at me. I think it's a valid point to, to talk about. Third thing is this. If you feel like you're losing your temper, there's no problem with just taking a break. And I know in the heat of the moment when the adrenaline's pumping, you're not like, oh, let's take five. You're not thinking that. In the, in the heat of the moment, in the adrenaline, you're thinking, I'm going to win. And I'm going to win at all costs. If I got to throw something, if I got to break a door, if I got to yell a uh, four letter expletive out in the front yard <laughs> for everybody to see in the neighborhood, you know, I'm telling you right now, it gets out of control. Remember, it's anger, it can control you. Remember the three weird things that control you? I know there's more than that, but we always talk about anger, alcohol, and lust. Those three things, do not let them have control of you because. They will completely control you. And you have to be really, really careful with all of them, especially anger. By the way, what I would do is this. When you leave here tonight and you go to Tony's or wherever you go, you're like, yeah, uh, you want me to wash down the pizza with pizza? Because we just had pizza. Sorry. <laughs> but um, sit down and talk to your husband or wife and say, listen, next time I go Incredible Hulk on you or Lou Ferrigno, that's the old hawk. Um, just know this. I'm going to walk away. And when I walk away, I'm not walking away because I want to dodge the issue. I'm walking away because I don't want it to get worse. We'll talk about it again soon, but I just want you to know, let's just set some ground rules before everybody's yelling and screaming. All right? <laughs> just an idea. All right. Number three, be generous. Listen. When you're generous, you're making it very clear that your possessions don't possess you. There are husbands and wives everywhere that feel second to stuff. They really do. They feel second to the material possessions that you as a, as a couple possess. You know, uh, a key to that is, okay, wife gets in an accident. You call her and you're like, is the car okay? How much for the damage? Bad first question, <laughs> all right? What, what do you think the first question ought to be? How, how are you? Exactly. How are you doing? So make sure you focus on the person and not so much the stuff. And a lot of times we love stuff more than we love the, the people involved. And, you know, obviously that just makes things confusing. Ephesians 4.28 says, if you're a thief, stop stealing. Begin using your hands for honest work and give generously to others in need. Um. You know, there's a reason why they call the Dead Sea the Dead Sea. We talk about that all the time. All it does is receive. It never gives anything away. And as a result of it, it's dead. And I think there's a lot of people walking around kind of like the walking dead. Never give anything away. Generous people are happy people. Misers are miserable people. Generosity gives marriage a clarity in, li in, in, clarity in life. And I think couples ought to be generous with their time, talent, and treasure to the people around them that are in need. Number four, when you're encouraging, Ephesians 4.29 says, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good, helpful, and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. This is an awkward question. It's just been awkward all night, so I might as well keep being awkward. Do you verbally abuse your spouse? It's an awkward question. If you're sitting there feeling like this massive tension, <laughs> let me just say this. Everybody gets angry. Most all couples go through some kind of anger. I mean, it's not the norm for couples to just have fights like, honey, I, <laughs> I beg your pardon. <laughs> you are so stinking cute, but 
I just, I just, I just disagree, love. It's not typically how it happens, okay? All I'm saying is we got to be careful because what happens is when we, we have to realize that words are powerful and you can rip somebody to shreds with your words. You can also encourage them and lift them up and build them up with your words. You can make their day with one word. You can ruin their week with one look. It stinks like that, but it's true. You can tell somebody over and over that they're stupid. And I'm going to tell you something. Eventually, they're going to believe it. You know what? They're right. I'm stupid. I'm so stupid. And it's a lie. Really and truly, what you are is a gift. You as a wife are a gift to your husband. You as a husband are a gift to your wife. And so the next time you're upset and getting ready to just freak out and have an argument, just go, you are such a gift. <laughs> then maybe you'll start laughing. And maybe it won't be so bad. I don't know. I'm bringing this up because people always say, man, when you talked about that, it was me. You were thinking about us. And da, da, da. Now, I might as well be preaching about noses. Everybody has a nose. Everybody has ears. Everybody that's married is going through these things. We're literally just talking about stuff that everybody goes through. So don't think that you're the only one or you're being singled out or whatever. Number five, when you love God. Loving God is huge because there are a lot of people out there that are convinced. I can have a wonderful relationship with God even though my relationship with my wife is rotten. I don't, think, I don't believe that. I don't believe it. Ephesians 4.30 says, don't bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit. There are things that we do that grieve God. There were things that we say that bring sorrow and grief to the Holy Spirit of God. And you know what 1 Peter says to men? It says this, if you treat your wives incorrectly, if you treat your wives roughly and wrong, God's not going to answer your prayer. That's what he says. He's not going to answer your prayer. Number six. That's a short one. Number six. You need to be thorough. If you want, if you want clarity in your marriage, be thorough. I love what Ephesians 4.31 says. It says get rid of all bitterness. It doesn't say some of it. You know, you ought to taper off on the bitterness. God doesn't say, come on, level that off. No, he says get rid of all of it. Get rid of all the bitterness, all the rage, all the anger, all the harsh words, all the slander, all the malicious behavior. Instead, do the complete opposite of it. Be kind and tenderhearted. What is the root or the foundation of kindness and being tenderhearted? I think it's, it, it's all wrapped up in the forgiveness word. It's all wrapped up in forgiveness. If you don't have forgiveness in your heart, if I don't have forgiveness in my heart, I'll always be bitter. I'll always be bitter to the person that hurt me or said something about me. I'm always going to be bitter. We got to forgive. And that forgiveness is going to lead us to be kind, even to our enemies, kind and tenderhearted to the people that hurt us. Because bitterness kills and rage and anger ruin marriages and harsh words kill love and slander ruins trust and malicious behavior just makes people enemies. What's the antidote? Forgiveness, kindness, tenderheartedness. You forgive. And by the way, God doesn't say this. God doesn't say, you make sure you love all the people that just love you. Love them. Because they love you. No, God says love the people that hate your guts. Love your enemies. You know, it's almost like we don't get credit for loving the people that love us. That's easy. We get credit for loving the people that hate our guts. <sighs> Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a minute? I wanted to give you a chance to accept Christ as your Savior tonight because this may be the first time you've ever been in church or are at our church or whatever it may be. And so I wanted to just give you a chance to put your faith in Jesus. Jesus is awesome. He is God in the flesh. He died on the cross and shed his blood so that your sins could be forgiven and you could have a relationship with God and you could have a home in heaven. And it's amazing. 
Um, if you become a believer in Jesus and a follower of Jesus, he'll give you eternal life. And it can happen right now, right here in this room, right in the seat that you're in right now. Um, it's easy for us. It was really hard for him because he took our sin and was nailed to a cross and was beaten beyond recognition. So he really went through severe pain and torture as well as taking our sin in his body. So it was very difficult. I mean, he's the God of the universe, but it's just amazing that he would love us that much and sacrifice that much for us. So if you're here tonight and you want to know Christ, then what I recommend you do is just give your heart to him. You know, it's not about a fancy prayer or where you are or whatever, but it's just about you believing. That's what it is. It's about believing. So if you'd like to give your heart to him and believe in him tonight, why don't you do that? Why don't you pray something like this? Dear Heavenly Father, I want you to know that I believe. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and three days later he rose from the dead. And I want to thank you for that sacrifice. It means everything to me. That you would love me that much. That you would sacrifice that much for me. Thank you for loving me. Sometimes I don't feel loved. Sometimes I feel alone. But I just believe with you. You're never going to leave me. You're always going to love me. You're always going to be there for me. I believe it's the best relationship I could ever possibly have. So I give you my life right now. I'm sorry for my sin. I confess it. I'm sorry. I'm a sinner. I admit it. Sometimes I have a hard time trusting your Bible and your template, your inventions. But I'm going to grow my faith in you and follow you and trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand, please, with heads bowed and eyes closed?